What really worries me today is what's going to happen to us if machines can think. And what interests me specifically is, can they? Well, that's a very hard question to answer. If you'd asked me that question just a few years ago, I'd have said it was very far-fetched. And today, I just have to admit, I don't really know. Well, if you're confused, Doctor, how do you think I feel? This is AI for the Rest of Us, a podcast from the University of Texas at Austin. I'm Mark Earhart. And I'm Casey Boyle. This is a show that helps explain artificial intelligence, what it means, who it affects, and what you need to know right now. I'm convinced that machines can and will think in our lifetime. There is going to be all this automation. People are going to be out of work. Computers are taking over now. Here I am playing chess with a computer. And then I just flick a switch on the modem and replace the receiver. I'm now waiting for the computer to answer me. Today on AI for the Rest of Us. It's not so much that we're against incorporating machines into our workflow, into our decision-making processes in our everyday life, but we want to do it in a way, right, that maintains some type of human presence, some type of human agency over how these systems get deployed and what they mean in our lives. Hi, Casey. Hey, Mark. Today, we're talking about the ways that AI is being used, or might soon be used, to help make high-stakes decisions about all aspects of our lives, from what interest rates people get on loans, to who gets hired for a job, to whether or not someone who's been convicted of a crime gets parole. Are AI systems better than humans at making these decisions? Why is it so tempting to give up our decision-making authority to machines? And what can we do to make sure these systems are fair and unbiased? Today we're talking with Craig Watkins, a professor of communications at UT Austin, who's been wrestling with these questions. Welcome, Craig, to our show. Nice to be here. Could you introduce yourself and kind of how your research fits into this whole theme of fairness in AI? Sure. Uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, I wear a few different hats, professor in the Moody College of Communication, executive director of the IC Squared Institute, and also one of the principal investigators uh, with the Good Systems Grand Challenge, which is UT's ethical, responsible AI campus-wide initiative. And my work focuses primarily on the challenges of both designing and deploying AI in ways that mitigate rather than perpetuate systemic forms of bias. What are some of the ways that AI might already be involved in high-stakes decisions that most of us are not even aware of yet? The reality is AI systems, algorithmic procedures have been incorporated into a variety of aspects of American life, think criminal justice, education, hiring, for example. And so oftentimes now, more and more companies that are hiring, particularly if they're hiring at scale, um, are oftentimes using AI systems, automated decision-making systems to help them screen out applicants to sort of identify who they think may be the best or brightest applicants for them. So AI is happening right in terms of our employment processes. AI is increasingly sort of creeping into the healthcare system in terms of how diagnoses are being made, but importantly, also in terms of how interventions are being designed uh, as well. And so questions emerge around, you know, how these systems make decisions and who's most likely to benefit from these decisions versus who's less likely to benefit from these systems. And then, of course, the ways in which AI is being applied in the criminal justice system. A number of judges, for example, for several years now have been using AI to make decisions about whether or not someone might be a repeat offender and therefore making decisions about whether or not they might be released back into society. Wow, that's, that's um, pretty pervasive. I mean, how should we feel about that? That sounds kind of almost dystopian, right? <laughs> like that. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's raising a, a lot of concerns. And I think fundamentally, the concern is what kind of society do we become once we start surrendering more and more authority to machines to make what have historically been human-driven or human-based decisions based on human expertise, based on human training, experience, and now increasingly we're deferring, right, to machines to make these kinds of decisions. And of course, the questions become, who's building these machines? What kinds of decisions are these machines making? And how comfortable are we as a society with surrendering more and more of that kind of authority to technology? And certainly, right, it's not like humans are, are perfect beings. We are certainly inclined towards bias. There's obviously a long history of that yeah. across many different institutions in American life. And so, you know, what happens once machines become more and more in charge of making these decisions? And for some, right, the, the sort of beauty or the opportunity, right, is that 
machines, if trained and designed properly, might be able to function in ways that mitigate the sort of historical biases that humans have been sort of prone to, to make. We've been hearing for years about biases in these systems that, not intentional, but just facial recognition uh, systems that, you know, implicate the wrong person in a crime, you know, uh, resume scoring systems that are biased towards, you know, white males, that sort of thing. Can you explain, like, why these biases keep popping up? And, you know, is it something fundamental about AI as a technology, or is it more about how they're being developed and how they're being used? Yes, yeah, a great question. I would say at its core, when you train an AI system or model to make a prediction or to generate a recommendation or a score, you're essentially using previous expressions or demonstrations of that decision-making process. And so let's say if it's hiring, for example, and you're trying to train a model to hire a teacher or an engineer, what you're likely to do, right, is to sort of use previous instances, previous data, previous hiring decisions where you feel like you've recruited well and they perform well, you are essentially training that model to replicate that process. And so the, one of the really interesting things about AI, right, is that we hear a lot about AI and the sophistication, the technology, and the sort of incredible advancements that it demonstrates. But in some respects, right, what we're really training AI to do are things that we've done in the past. And so when you're modeling, when you're building systems, you're training those things on decisions that have been made in the past. You're training those systems mm -hmm. on recommendations that have been made in the past. And so now what you're doing is just it's more efficiency. You're automating, right? You're sort of reducing the amount of human labor, cognitive labor, that's required to perform that same act. But I think a really interesting question is, we, are we fundamentally asking AI to do something really different or radically different when we train it to make a recommendation, to score, to predict? In many respects, we aren't, right? And so even as these systems presumably right or, or forward-looking or, or defining the future, they're oftentimes predicated on behaviors and decisions that have been made in the past. And so given the ways in which biases are oftentimes implicated in virtually you know, any kind of human endeavor, you're also sort of training and um, equipping and in, endowing the model with the capacity to simply replicate those biases, oftentimes implicit or unseen biases, but nevertheless biases that then influence the kinds of decisions or outputs that are generated by a system. And is it kind of worse in some ways in that it's, it's actually making it faster to come to that biased conclusion? It's bypassing even, you know, any gut check? It's just... That, that's the absolute concern, right, is that you're accelerating, that you're scaling, that you're essentially automating via machine technology, the ability to do these things at a pace that's kind of unprecedented. And that's, I think that's the real big concern is to what extent AI, as we currently know it today, is in some ways, right, just an automated way of practicing, you know, historical kinds of decision-making and then all of the biases that are implicated in those decision-making processes. That's really mm -hmm. fascinating because I you always hear that the hype is that AI is really innovative. It's the forefront of technology, but it's also the trailing edge of, of humanity's own biases, problems. It's just a, a sort of repeating machine. <laughs> How do we go back and repeat the past over and over and over again, but really fast and, and really big? <laughs> it's kind of a kind of a sad irony in that. Um, there was one example that I've I've seen you you've used before in in talks about predictive policing. Sort of the idea that that you could have an AI system, you know, look at past historical data on policing, and then that could inform where we should be putting police resources today on the ground, because that's where the crimes have been happening, right? So it, it sort of makes a certain kind of, you know, logical sense that, yeah, maybe that's a, a good way to go. But maybe you could kind of explain why, why that doesn't actually work as intended. Yeah, no, it's a great example. I think predictive policing is a classic sort of case study of the problems that we're increasingly identifying in terms of how AI systems work. The idea with predictive policing is really building an analytical tool that allows you to sort of anticipate, right, where certain kinds of crimes or criminal activities are, are likely to take place. These predictions are based on sort of historical precedent, right, what, what's happened in the past. But what you see, right, is a sort of vicious, self-fulfilling prophecy. If in the past we have had certain assumptions about certain populations, about certain geographical areas, and therefore, we allocate more policing resources, we allocate more surveillance resources in those geographical areas targeted towards those populations. The probability, right, for being arrested is just going to increase. The probability for identifying crime is just going to increase. And so now you're oftentimes building systems, AI systems, 
that are sort of fed that historical past, right? Fed that data. You kind of see the vicious cycle, right, that emerges here. And so you get into real serious problems there in terms of what we call disparate impacts, where you begin to start seeing, right, certain populations rendered more vulnerable, certain populations being treated or in some ways responded to in ways that um, lead to less life-enhancing outcomes. It's like uh, no matter which advance we have, we keep just rounding up the usual suspects every single time, right? <laughs> More efficient ways of doing so, which is pretty awful. It doesn't innovate much. Right. Yeah. And with this predictive policing, it's like you're, um, you know, you're not really predicting where crime is most likely to happen. You're predicting where people are most likely to get arrested, right? right? right. Or where yeah. people are most likely to be surveilled. Yeah. Or So it's, right, it's not really doing what it says it does, right? right? Is and that, and, and that's, that's a good point. And it's an illustration that was oftentimes referred to as the alignment problem. In artificial intelligence. And typically, right, the way in which the alignment problem is described is building a system that leads to an AI system that leads to unintended consequences, precisely what, what, what you just described. So imagine building a system to sort of predict who's going to be a repeat offender or building a system to predict who's likely to you know, repay a loan or whatever the case might yeah. be. And what we've seen is once these models get deployed, they actually end up doing something very different. So rather than a model that helps judges sort of identify who's most likely to be a repeat offender, what you end up doing is really creating a model that basically predicts who's most likely to be arrested. Yeah. And so that's a very different kind of model. It leads to very different kinds of outcomes. So this notion that the AI that we're building is somehow misaligned with our values as a democratic society. So we don't want, presumably as a democratic society, a judicial system, right, that punishes people unfairly. We don't want a hiring system, right, that favors male applicants over female applicants. And yet this is oftentimes what we get when we see these models being deployed in these different instances or domains. You alluded to this earlier, but this this idea of, you know, us giving up some authority or control to AI models, I mean, it's kind of seductive, right? This this If you're in a position where you have to make high-stake decisions, it's kind of seductive to say, oh, here's some magic technology that will just take that burden off and will make the decision for you. Can you talk a little bit about that, about the, that it's not just the technology per se, you know, biases that it might have or the way it's being developed, but also kind of the way it's being implemented in a way that it takes humans out of the loop in some cases? Yeah, and I think this is a critical issue as well. You know, what's our relationship going to be to these systems and how do we create more balance, right, in terms of power, in terms of how decisions get made, I like to make the case that what we really should be building are systems that augment, support, and enhance human intelligence and expertise, as opposed to building systems that sort of automate, replace, or substitute for human intelligence and expertise. And I think that's going to be a really interesting challenge moving forward. And there are a number of different sort of movements beginning to start popping up. I'm working with a, a few different organizations who are trying to do more of this kind of work that is saying, hey, we want greater human control of these systems. We want more human in the loop sort of parameters for how these systems work. In other words, right, it's, it's not so much that we're against incorporating machines into our workflow, into our decision-making processes in our everyday life, but we want to do it in a way, right, that, that maintains some type of human presence, some type of human agency, human influence over how these systems get deployed and what they mean in our lives. If you were grand designer of the AI universe, and if you could completely control how AI systems are designed, built, implemented, what would you do differently? I would implement kind of a core framework, if not policy even, that when you're building an AI system, that you include stakeholders. So there are a number of different ethical principles, AI ethical principles that, are, that have been developed over the years around fairness, around equity. But one that I'm particularly interested in and, and something that we're trying to incorporate more and more in our research is what I would refer to as inclusive design. And what I mean by that, is, so, so I can give you a specific example. Great, yeah. So we're working on a, a project that's been funded by the National Institutes of Health to basically see if you can design AI and machine learning models to understand and maybe even predict the risk factors that are associated with youth suicide and even more precisely with the suicide behaviors of young African-Americans. Mm -hmm. The rates of suicide among that segment of the population have been growing significantly over the last 10 or so years. And what we've decided, right, is that any AI or machine learning algorithm or model that we build without the input from stakeholders, right, who are invested in this issue, 
who are involved in communities, who are addressing this crisis in an everyday, sort of completely invested way, that unless they're involved in the process, unless they're informing how we're thinking about our data, unless they're informing how we're building our models, unless they're informing how we're critiquing what our models are recommending, predicting or identifying as those risk factors, that, that we're essentially building a system that may have little relevance right. right, to the work that they do. And so for me, as we think about deploying AI in higher and higher stakes environments, making sure that we're bringing the right kinds of experiences and expertise, the right voices to ensure right that we are practicing right methods, techniques that will allow us to understand this in ways right that are relevant to those who stand to benefit or be impacted by these systems. It's surprising to me how similar a lot of these problems are in terms of technology and advance. So, for instance, um, I do a lot of work in accessibility, technology and accessibility, writing. And in the disability studies community and disability communities, there's that motto is nothing about us without us. And uh, just to have tech people over here designing what they think will be good for someone who might be blind or deaf or, or have some mobility challenges but never include them in the loop and the design process is always just a a failed project. It always ends up being Mm -hmm. a failed project. And and my sense is, you know, I I think the work that we do here at the University of Texas, that a number of my other colleagues at other universities do, but even industry, right? I, I, for example, recently been doing some work with some folks at Google, some teams at Google, Mm -hmm. and they're also recognizing the need to bring other voices that you need more than, particularly when you're deploying AI in these sort of, high stakes, sensitive domains, that you need more than computational right. power and expertise. Right. That you need domain expertise. You need nuance. You need experience, right, in that domain to really enrich and inform what it is you're trying to do. And so I think there's just a recognition, right, that only having computational experts, computer scientists, engineers, data scientists at the table, that that's no longer a feasible, you know, solution for building systems that are actually going to work for the many, you know, rather than the few. Do you feel like that's changing at all? Do you think like across the industry, they're getting that message that it's slow? To, yeah, you know? I, I would say that it's not a standard practice as of yet, and we're we're likely still seeing systems being built from a sort of select or elite few who sort of think because they have technological or computational expertise. Mm-hmm that they can then deploy that in ways that would have relevance, right, across these many different domains. And in fact, what we're learning, right, is that that's so not true. And yet, um, you know, I think that message is slowly beginning to spread, but it's by no means, I think, the norm or the standard practice, and hence a long way to go in terms of ensuring that this notion of inclusive design is a standard practice. In the spirit of ending on a good note, uh, what gives you hope? I would just use my students, for for instance, as, as an example of what gives me hope. Today, when I'm in an undergraduate classroom, students are aware of algorithms. Students are aware that the social media that they use or the websites that they browse, that there's something happening somewhere in a black box that's informing and shaping what they see, informing and shaping the kind of information that they, they have access to or don't have access to, and they're aware of that in a way that, that 10, 15 years ago just simply was not the case, right? So just the, the recognition, right, that something is happening technologically, procedurally, right, from these systems at least opens up the opportunity for us to become more educated, for us to begin to start asking questions, for us to begin sort of scrutinizing the technology that we're engaged with. And so I think what's happened is a door has been opened now to where we as a society can begin to form a vocabulary to form, right, the cognitive capacity to sort of think critically about these systems, to push back against the powers that be, to say, hey, we can do better than this, to say, hey, we no longer want to be surveilled. We no longer want to be monitored. We no longer want to be exploited, right? We want uh, greater agency in these systems. And so understanding, right, how our information is used, understanding how our data and our profiles are being monetized, it's not where we would like for it to be, but I think there's just greater awareness. My hope, right, is that that awareness will only continue to expand, will only continue to grow, which hopefully, right, will will continue to apply more and more pressure, greater and greater expectations from how technology companies should be moving forward as they advance these systems, recognizing, right, that people are now aware of the game, 
that at some point, right, regulation is coming. And so in, in this sense, right, these power asymmetries that I alluded to earlier, hopefully, right, some balance gets restored as they begin to sort of educate and develop a more literate population in regards to how these systems work and function. It reminds me of like my students when deepfakes came out and AI generated images, they started not just questioning if that was real or not, but they started questioning other images that they should have been questioning in the yeah. first place, yeah. right? Like all images that we create are framed. They've got certain perspectives. They've got certain, you know, alignments that imbue all kinds of different biases or, or whatnot in them. But uh, it was only after the advent and, and generation of AI generated stuff that they started questioning all the images, not just those, right? And having that, that awareness, having that kind of antenna is going to be really important because we know, right, that as we move forward, a greater and greater percentage, and, and at some point, virtually all of the content yeah. that's generated for the internet, for the web, that circulates through social media, is going to be AI generated. And so just recognizing that and understanding that will sort of predispose us, right, to sort of be hesitant, to be critical, to be reluctant, right, to sort of think, oh, this is true, simply because, right, it's on the internet. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, as, as a writer, that kind of breaks my heart a little bit to, <laughs> to hear. <laughs> but uh, but, it, but you do lay out a positive vision, though, for people being better critical thinkers and, and, and hopefully some regulation down the road that'll <laughs> help us uh, avoid the worst possible outcomes. Craig, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it, and we really enjoyed it. Thank you. That's our show. Next time on AI for the Rest of Us. The knee-jerk reaction with AI often is that it is this magical, mystical thing. And if we make regulation based off of misunderstandings or misperceived risks, or we're missing risks that aren't regulated, that has the potential to be very bad. AI for the Rest of Us is a production of the University of Texas at Austin's College of Natural Sciences and College of Liberal Arts. Our show is part of the university's Year of AI. To learn more, visit yearofai.utexas.edu. For links and more resources on today's topic, go to aifortherest.net. Big thanks today to our guest, Craig Watkins. Our executive producers are Christine Sinatra and Dan Oppenheimer. Sound design and audio editing by Robert Scaramuccia. Our theme music is by Aeolos Rue. Our interviews are recorded by the fabulous audio engineers at the Liberal Arts ITS Recording Studio. Thanks for listening.